Today's doctors, drugs, and medical devices truly work medical miracles for young and old alike. But there are some as phony as a $3 bill. Today's episode, Ironed Out. Most Americans today understand that proper levels of iron are essential to human health and that a shortfall can lead to dangerous consequences. But we also know that mislabeled products or products that promise false cures can be just as harmful. A lesson underscored by a tale from FDA's History Vault involving one unscrupulous businessman who sought to profit by promoting phony cures using iron tablets. Early in the 20th century, many Americans believed that decreased energy was associated with blood loss or weakness. So to treat this, they often took what were called blood builders, which contained stimulants to pep them up. One popular treatment was a small pill of nuxated iron, which contained iron and nux vomica, a derivative of the strychnine tree that is highly toxic to humans and other animals. The pill was promoted as a cure for a broad range of conditions, including fatigue, malnutrition, nervousness, and lack of blood, as well as things like pallid complexion and a loss of sexual vitality. Sales of the pill skyrocketed, the success due largely to the ingenious and often deceptive marketing tactics of its proprietor, a relentless charlatan named E. Virgil Neal, whose history included a profitable cosmetic company, a conviction for mail fraud, and a stint as a hypnotist with the name Dr. Xenophon Lamotte Sage. After World War I, Neal saw the opportunity for exploiting the burgeoning healthcare field of vitamins and minerals. But the public had a little understanding of this emergent field and, as a result, were easy prey for Neil's uh, marketing tactics and phony claims of the therapeutic value of his product as well as the insistence that it was on the cutting edge of science. Neil flooded newspapers with product advertisements promising to alleviate that tired feeling. Women were told that nuxated iron would help them regain their youthful complexion as well as their husband's affectionate gaze. Paid celebrity testimonials from prominent athletes touted nuxated iron's invigorating and strength-building qualities. But Neil's claims began to face greater scrutiny especially after the Journal of the American Medical Association reported the case of a young boy dying of strychnine poisoning after consuming nearly an entire bottle of nuxated iron. Even as Neil's quackery was being exposed, the FDA was unable to prosecute him because the 1906 Pure Food and Drugs Act only prohibited mislabeled ingredients and intentionally untruthful therapeutic claims, and nuxated iron actually contained negligible quantities of the claimed ingredients. Following the passage of the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the government was finally able to take action against Neal for misbranding. Under the revised law, the government was no longer required to provide proof of intent to defraud when products made false or fraudulent health claims. Today, FDA continues to play a critical role in protecting consumers from fraudulent, adulterated, and misbranded products like nuxated iron. We hope you have enjoyed your visit to the vault. Welcome to the FDA's History Vault, containing more than 10,000 items from FDA's history. Today's episode, Radiating Shoe Sales. In the late 1890s, scientists discovered radiographic imaging, or X-rays. This remarkable scientific discovery allowed doctors to see inside the human body without invasive surgery. But, as with most cutting-edge science, it also inspired uses of variable therapeutic value. During the First World War, thousands of soldiers were afflicted with trench foot, and many more developed chronic foot problems from poor-fitting military boots. The military developed a science of shoe fitting, which was embraced by podiatrists, osteopaths, and shoe retailers. Boston physician Dr. Jacob Lowe used the science to invent and patent a device that allowed him to see moving x-rays of his patient's feet without having to remove their boots. In 1927, Lowe sold his patent to the Adrian X-ray Company of Milwaukee, which led to the use in shoe stores of this device, the Shoe Fitting Fluoroscope which was marketed as a scientific method for optimizing shoe fit. This particular model is part of the FDA history collection and is on display at the White Oak campus. The marketing focus quickly shifted from veterans to young children and their mothers who were anxious about their children's healthy growth. Shoe salesmen used the fluoroscopic technology to suggest, misleadingly, that they had orthopedic expertise. The marketing worked. By the 1940s, there were at least 10,000 fluoroscopes in shoe stores across the United States. Unfortunately, the machines not only didn't do what they promised, they exposed children, their parents, and store clerks to unhealthy doses of radiation. 
The device typically consisted of a large wooden cabinet with an x-ray tube at the base and just a few inches above that a cutout window where the customer would place their feet virtually right on top of the x-ray device. There are also three viewing scopes, one for the child, the mother, and the shoe salesman, uh, where they would see a green outlined hue of the x-ray of child's feet. The design of the device allowed for a large degree of radiation leakage, starting at the foot area, coming up to a, a, a about the pelvic area, and going out up to 10 feet from the device. In the 1940s, scientists and regulators began to raise serious concerns about the shockingly high levels of radiation emitted by the fluoroscopes and the risk posed to children and clerks. Mounting professional opposition led to changes in laws. As of 1970, a total of 50 states had taken some form of legislative action against the device. The FDA never was able to take action against manufacturers of the shoe-fitting fluoroscope because at the time it didn't have regulatory authority over radiation-emitting devices. However, by the early 1970s, concerns about radiation were being raised about appliances like televisions and microwave ovens, and by 1971, FDA was given authority over radiation-emitting devices. Today, the regulation of radiation-emitting products is delegated to FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health, which not only protects consumers from harmful novelty devices like the shoe-fitting fluoroscope, but also sets standards for medical imaging, as well as surgical and therapeutic equipment, security systems, and consumer products. We hope you have enjoyed your visit to the Vault. Today's episode, Trying Times. During the 1950s, many unknowing American consumers were put at risk by the smallest of food products, the seeds used by many American farmers to grow wheat. The danger came because some farmers used mercury-treated seeds to grow their wheat, and a number of these seeds found their way, both by accident and intentionally, into the food supply. The threat to humans was enormous. Methylmercury poisoning can damage the brain and nervous system. Luckily, FDA inspectors and chemists were on the job, and employing a variety of means, including sampling tools to scientifically collect the product and improved rapid lab analyses for mercury, they were able to prevent a potential catastrophe. One of the most important and effective tools used by FDA's team of inspectors to help ensure the safety of foods entering commerce was also one of the simplest and most common, an object known as a trier. There were not only triers for grain, but many other products, including cheese, frozen eggs, olives, and many other items. The trier did exactly what its name implied, allowing the inspector to try or sample a product so that it could be tested for purity and safety. Triers were particularly helpful to an inspector in part because they were easy to transport, even though some, like these grain triers, had to be quite large because they were intended to reach into railroad cars or silos. The trier was effective because of its unique design. No matter what the product, it allowed inspectors to take samples from the entire product, top, middle, and bottom, and get a fair sampling. This is an olive trier used to retrieve and sample olives from the giant oak barrels out of which they were often sold. Of course, no matter how effective an inspector or a trier was at sampling, it was impossible to reveal every problem or danger. This was particularly true in food industries, many of which were undergoing major changes as a result of advances in technology. But the new technology was not perfect. Products such as olives had a low acid content, allowing a deadly anaerobic toxin to proliferate in sealed cans. Triers continued to be used up to and through the 1980s when they began to be replaced by more precise and automated sampling methods. The changes coincided with an expanded focus on industry prevention of food contamination, leading to the 2011 Food Safety Modernization Act. This groundbreaking law shifted FDA's focus from reliance on sampling and testing in response to outbreaks to the anticipation of production problems that would prevent outbreaks of foodborne illnesses. It's all part of FDA's continuing history and evolution as an agency that uses the best available science to protect American consumers. We hope you've enjoyed your visit to the vault. Welcome to the FDA's History Vault, containing more than 10,000 items from FDA's history. 
Among the artifacts are tools used by those who carry out the agency's mission, which highlights advances in science and technology, and many of the deceptive and dangerous foods, medicines, and so-called medical products that FDA has helped remove from commerce and that have led to important changes in laws and regulations. Today's episode, A Calculating History. FDA's work requires enormous amounts of data analysis, which involves high-level calculations. When Harvey Wiley came to Washington in 1883 to become the chief chemist of the Department of Agriculture, he, of course, brought with him a very reputable uh, scientific reputation. Uh, He was a chemist by training, and he immediately launched into studies of food, uh, food adulteration, and other investigations. There's a probably a pretty good chance that in his early work, uh, Harvey Wiley would have used, and his analysts, uh, would have used uh, this device. This is actually a calculating device, the Thatcher Calculating Instrument. It was patented in 1881, and it actually was a very powerful calculating tool, uh, probably because it was both round and could slide back and forth. It had almost the power of several individual slide rules. So it could uh, do multiplication, division, it could calculate interest if you wanted to do that, it could, it could calculate roots and, and uh, powers of numbers, and it could do that to about five significant figures. It was uh, also accurate uh, to within about 0.01 percent, so that's incredible accuracy at that time. Uh, now this device, of course, was uh, superseded eventually by, by less bulky calculating devices. Shortly after mid-century, handheld calculators were common. Uh, and certainly, uh, even uh, not too long after that, computers became the bulwark of those running analyses. So the way calculations were made has changed over the years. Uh, the, the complexity of the things that the FDA analyzes has, of course, changed as the technology has changed. But uh, that's why regulatory science and keeping pace with changes in commodities that we regulate is so important. The FDA's collection of historical artifacts provides a journey through American history and documents the critical role played by one of the nation's oldest public health agencies in support of its mission to promote and protect American health. We hope you enjoyed your visit.